Um, if you have your Bible, open it up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to look at two verses, verse 2 and verse 3. Um, 1 Thessalonians is a small book. Um, it's right after uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, New Testament. If, if you don't have a Bible, uh, there's one in the pew rack in front of you, and, it, and the page number that's in the bulletin is for that pew Bible. And if you don't have a Bible at all, we'd love for you to take that Bible. It's kind of a gift from, from us to you. We, we value God's Word, and we want God's Word in people's hands. And so if you don't have one, we'd love for you to take it. So this morning, we're going to finish up our family series. This is the last Sunday of of a Family Matters series, and some of you are, are secretly cheering. <laughs> You're going, yes, we're moving on. Because I know we've been talking about this for a long time, since the first Sunday in February, and here we are, June 19th, and uh, we are finishing up the series. And, and Chad said this, and I've said this, and we've spent a lot of time on this because we believe that it's important, right? Um, the, the success of the family depends upon each individual uh, uh, seeking after God's leadership. And, and families matter to God, and so they matter to us as a church. Whatever makeup your family looks, you know, whatever it is, whether it's mom and dad and, and, and kids, or if it's single parent, or if it's a step family, a blended family, uh, whatever, whatever your family, however your family is made up, that, that matters to God, and so in turn it, it, matters, it matters to us as a church. And so we talked about what it means to be good parents and, and what it means to have a good marriage, what it means to, be, uh, uh, to have a family and, and, and drawing your family to the Lord and leading your family. And so we, we're talking about that. And so we're closing out our series, though. We're not, instead of talking about our individual families, we're going to talk about our entire church family. We're going to talk about us, First Baptist Church Allen, and um, God's desire and his plan for us. God, God's brought us together for a common purpose, and that purpose is to love him, okay, to love and to worship him, that purpose is to love each other, to minister to one another, to care for one another, uh, to do life together. And that purpose is, is to take God's love outside of these walls and to share that love with our community and with our world. That's, that's why we exist. And it's not an accident. I want you to hear this. It's not an accident that God has placed us, you and me, he's placed us in this church, okay? And he's placed this church in this city for this time. That's not an accident. That's very intentional. And God wants to use First Baptist Allen, to make a powerful impact, not only on each other, but in our community. And I want you to think about this question, okay? You may have heard this question asked before, uh, but, but I want to I tell you, or I want to ask you again. If our church went away today, okay, if it just went away, it ceased to exist, would we be missed? Now, I know as members and regular attenders, we would miss this church. We, we, we would miss it. But, but what about our community? Would our community miss us? If we were gone tomorrow, would, would the city of Allen even, no, even, even notice? I mean, is it how, how big of an impact are we making in the community, in the city, in, 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 in our area? That, that, uh, how, how far reaching are we? are we? Are we ministering that if all of a sudden we were gone, would, would people know? Would people, would people miss us? And I want to ask this a different way, too. Uh, kind of bring it more home personally. If you stop being a Christian today, if you stop being a Christian today, would anyone notice? Would anyone see a difference? See, I, I want you to understand something. When I say First Baptist Church of Allen, I'm not referring to the physical structures located here at 201 East McDermott. Okay, you know that. I'm not talking about the buildings. When I say FBC Allen, I'm talking about you and me. Okay, we are the church. So the question is, as a people, are we making an impact in our community? How is First Baptist Church, Allen, okay, you and me, remember that's you and me, how are we impacting our school districts as teachers, as students, as staff members? How, how are we making an impact in our school districts? How is First Baptist Church, Allen, remember that's, that's you and me, how are we impacting our neighborhoods that we live in? How is First Baptist Church, Allen, remember, that's, that's you and me, how are we impacting the places where we work uh, and the places that, that we do life? How is First Baptist Church, Allen, and in case you've forgotten, that's you and that's me, how are we impacting the, uh, the sports teams that our kids play on, um, the, the, the people that come into our lives, the places where we shop, the places where we do business? What effect is this church having on this area? Now, you ever walk into a, 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 a business or, you know, any, any place that has glass 
glass doors. Uh, we have them here at the church, but you ever gone and you've seen them, you've seen someone clean them. I've seen this several times. Somebody's just finished cleaning them and they walk away and somebody, you know, sometimes it's a kid, sometimes it's an adult, just palms the window and pushes the door open instead of using the handles. And it's just, there's just this big old handprint now that's just stuck on the window for everyone to see. Now, uh, I want you to have that image because here's, here's what I believe. I believe that our fingerprints should be all over this community. Our finger, because if, if, we're the, if we're the hands of God, if, if we're God's representatives, then, then, then our fingerprints should be all over, all over where, where we do work, where we do, where we do school, where we, where we uh, do life, where we live, because as God's hands, as his representatives, then he is using us, or he wants to use us, to make an impact on our community. And this, the title for today's sermon is called The Ripple Effect. And you know what I'm talking about. You, you've probably done this many times. You've thrown a rock into a, a pond or a creek or a lake or something. And when it hits the water, when that rock hits the water, you see the ripples that go out from where the rock went in. Okay. Now, I, I know there's probably some scientific explanation as, you know, where the water drags, the, the rock drags the water down and the water, you know, and I don't know what it is, but it's, I, didn't, I was too lazy to look it up. But I do know that when the rock hits the water, something happens, right? The ripples go out. And it makes an impact because of, because of what the rock did to the water. There's energy, okay? There's energy that forces the water out, and it makes those ripples. And, and here's the thing. I think, I think people misunderstand what church is all about. Many people think that church is all about me, okay? Not me, Jimmy, but like us. It's just, it's just about us. And, but, but our pastor, yeah, last week did an amazing job talking about this in, in the context of, uh, he was talking about how Jesus loved kids and, and how we need to prioritize children in, in ministry. But he, he said that as a church, we shouldn't just be concerned with our own children, like our own, our own children, my three kids. I shouldn't just be concerned with my three kids, but that we should have a heart and a burden for all children. And it's easy to walk into this place, okay, and, and say, what have you got for me? Okay, what, 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 what do you got? I'm here, you know, wow me, entertain me, uh, uh, do something for me. But nothing could be further from God's desire for his church. Yes, our church is going gonna, gonna to minister to you and, 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 and you're going to be blessed by this church. But a part of being the church means that we minister to others. You see, because when the rock hits the water, the ripples, they go out. They don't go in, but they go out. And God, we can't be in the city or in this community, and, and say, you know what? That's not our problem. That's not our problem. We're just, we're just going to do our thing. We're just going to stay together. We're going to do our thing. No, God's placed you and me. He's placed us, First Baptist Church Allen, right here to have an impact that reaches beyond our walls into the city, into our state, country, and literally all over the world. And Charles Spurgeon, he said it this way, if there be any one point in which the Christian church ought to keep its fervor at a white heat, it is concerning missions. If there be anything about which we cannot tolerate lukewarmness, it is the matter of sending the gospel to a dying world. You see, Jesus' last words to his disciples were, go. He said, go. They weren't supposed to ignore their community. They weren't supposed to let someone else worry about it. They weren't supposed to just, you know, just take care of your family and, and you'll be, let, let everyone else take care of themselves or just, just stay together and meet and just, you know, to just, just be good together. But no, he, he said to go, go out, go make disciples, go spread the message, go tell people about him. You see, even Jesus said it. Jesus said, I didn't come so that you would serve me, but I came to, be, to, to go and to serve. As the body of Christ, we should make a, a huge impact in our community. And I think in a lot of ways we are, but I also think that it could be better. You know, the, the song that we just sang, there's still a lot of work to be done in this city. And I think, it, I think what we're doing could improve. And as a group of individuals, there is a lot of talent and ability just sitting in this room right now, in this place that God wants to use to further his kingdom. But it all starts with this mindset that church is not just about me and what I want, but it's also about how God wants to use me to impact my world. And this morning I want to talk to you about how one church, okay, how our church can change this community. Okay, we're, we're a big rock, okay? We're a big rock that's been placed right here. And I think that we should be making some huge, some major 
ripples. Let's read our passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was, was writing to this, to this new church, and he was very proud of this church. They were, a, <clears throat> they were a new congregation, but they had already made, it, they'd already made a, their mark. And Paul is talking to them, and, he, and he's telling them that, that he, he is so grateful to God for them and their spiritual stamina in the face of opposition. Now, if, if you haven't read much of Scripture and Paul writing these letters, he, um, all the churches that, that he helped start, they always come under some kind of struggle, whether it's, whether it's an internal struggle or, or, or external. Usually what happens is, is the new believers are, are, are being challenged by the people who, 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 you know, they've changed and all these other people around them go, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing this? So come back to the way that it used to be. Or, or other people would come in, usually the, the Jewish people, they would come in and say, listen, well, there's Jesus, sure, there's the gospel of Jesus, but there's other things too. You've got to do this too. So it's Jesus and something else. And so they would, they would go into that and a lot of people would try to come and discredit Paul. And say, Paul has no right to come in and do what he's doing and to share this gospel. And so they would, always, they would always come under some kind of opposition. And so Paul was telling them he was so thankful for, their, for staying strong. And in this passage, Paul, he lists three things, okay? Three qualities that should be and need to be true of any church that's going to have an impact in the community. And if we can, okay, FBC Allen. Now remember, that's, that's you and that's me. If we can make these a part of who we are as individuals and as a corporate body, then we have the potential through the strength and leadership of Jesus Christ to change this community. Okay? Now, um, I don't know what that reality does in you. I know we're not, a, we're not really a, a hooping and hollering church where we're, amen, preach it, brother, come on, boy. You know, we, I know that's not, our, that's not who we are, okay? I get that, okay? But the fact that that, that reality is that, that God... that that God wants to use us, okay, and through his strength and ability, if, if we can have these qualities that we're fixing to talk about, we can literally change this community, okay? That should excite you, okay? That should, like, kind of at least cause you to perk up and go, what, what, what's this, what? What's this all about? Because I, 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 I want that. I want to be a part. I want to be a part of this community coming to know Christ. So I'm going to give you three things that w- how a how one church, and I'm not talking about any other church today, okay? I'm going to be real selfish, and I'm going to talk about First Baptist Church Allen. I'm going to talk about us. How can one church change a community? Well, here's the first one, based on what we saw there in our passage in Thessalonians, First Thessalonians. Number one is, how can a cha- church change a community? Through a faith that leads to action. A faith that leads to action. In verse 3, Paul mentions their work of faith. Okay, Paul tells them later, and if you read verse 8, it says that your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So this church, because of who they are and their faith in God, it's already spread out. And it's, people are hearing about that. But it wasn't just their great faith. It wasn't just that alone, but it was their faith that led them to do something. Okay? It was a faith that led them not to just be sitting and, and being sponges that, that soaked everything in, but instead it led them to go out. It led them to, to pour out what themselves, to pour out what they've learned onto their community. They're going out and they're doing something with their newfound faith. One commentary talking about this passage in 1 Thessalonians said, The exact nature of the work produced by faith is a combination of direct missionary work. Okay, he's listening about why people knew about their faith. Because of their direct missionary work, because of their goodness towards others, okay, and because of their loyalty to Christ. Christ in the face of severe persecution. You see, this church was changing their community because they were not caught up in just thinking about themselves, but they were overwhelmed with the sense of urgency to share the truth that they had learned and that they experienced through the gospel of Jesus Christ that was shared to them by Paul. You know, and you look at those three those phrases, okay? They were, they were busy about missionary work. They were sharing the gospel. They were busy about doing good towards others, Okay? They weren't just sitting by. They were, they were out in the community. They were out in the city. They were doing things, doing good for others. And they were loyal in the face of opposition, okay? Those three things, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like an unstoppable force. That's a, that's a church, okay, that will make an eternal difference. Now, their faith was in God. 
and their value was in God, and their mission was found in God, and their hope was in God. When you're that hyper-focused, okay, then it changes everything about you. If you're that hyper-focused on God, and I think part of our problem as Christians, as believers in this church, is sometimes we're not totally confident in God. We're not totally hopeful in Him. We're not totally sold on this idea that God, that He really is enough. And when that's the case, then, then it's easy to get selfish. It's easy to kind of to turn inward. And, and if God is not enough, then, then you start making excuses. And, and it's easy to focus on other things. And you start figuring out, okay, well, if God's not enough, then I've got to take charge. I've got to take control. I've got to do things. Or I've got to look for, for ways to, to kind of fill in the gaps. And as believers, I want you to know this. Satan can't change our eternity. But what he can do is he can limit and diminish our effectiveness. One of the most dangerous attitudes I think that a believer can have is when they say, you know what, I'm, I'm good, I'm done. I'm done. I'm saved, my kids are saved, uh, we're, we're all good. Now I can just sit back and, and, and I can enjoy life. I can just come to church, I can just sit and soak, be a part of all kinds of Bible studies and just learn, 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 learn. But let me tell you something, that's exactly where, where the enemy wants you to be. Okay. Now, yes, God wants us to be saved. He wants us to share the gospel with our families. Yes, God wants us to be a part of Bible study. Yes, God wants us to come to church. God wants us to grow in our faith. But more than just that, he wants us to take what we've learned and he wants us to go. You see, the enemy, he doesn't want you living out your faith. He doesn't want you busy sharing the gospel. He doesn't want you doing good in the name of Jesus. That's, that's for other people to do. That's not for you. You just sit down, you take a load off, you work hard, okay? You're, you, you work hard and, and you, you deserve a break. You've earned it. But that's not the faith that Jesus talks about. James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, it says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, well, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, those verses confuse a lot of people because you might be saying, well, wait a minute, I thought faith, salvation, that came through grace, uh, not by anything that we did. That, came, that comes through Jesus Christ. And Paul isn't saying that you have to earn your, your, your faith. That, that's not what this passage is saying. The, the resounding answer, do we have to earn our salvation or earn God's love, is no. Okay, that comes from him. But what Paul is communicating here is that true faith in Christ, it will produce good works. Okay? Faith in Christ will produce good works. He's not saying that true faith is a result of good works. You see the difference? Faith produces. It's not the result of works. Salvation, you know this, or you should know this, salvation can only come through a faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul's saying if you're saved, then there really, really should be some evidence of that in how you live. It's an issue of obedience. If you believe in God, then, then, then it, should, it should show in how you live your life and how you treat people and, and you sharing the gospel and you producing fruit. It, it, there should be some evidence, Paul is saying. You say you love God. You say you're a believer. Okay, I want to see that because it, it should come out in your life. It's an issue of obedience. We believe in God, then we're going to obey His commands. We're going to obey all His commands. I mean, it's like if I came up to you today and I said, I, I, I'm a jockey. Okay? Some of you laughed, and I'm, I'm offended. Okay? I'm a jockey. Well, you'd say, well, Jimmy, you don't, you, you, don't, uh, you don't really own a horse. I've never really seen you ride a horse. You're never around horses. Um, not to mention, you, you don't really fit the build of a jockey, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I could say, I could say it, but really there is, and you would be right. I don't know how to ride a horse, okay? I, uh, I've been on horses before, but it's those horses that you ride on those, those trail rides, you know, where, where the horse, you just kind of kick it and it automatically goes. You don't have to do anything. It just follows the trail. It knows where to go. You know, they tell you, oh, pull this way. You don't have to do anything. It's going to go right where it's supposed to go. Okay. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't ride horses. I don't have a barn. I don't live near them. I don't, you know, they, they're big and smelly. You know, I'm sure they say that to me too, but I just don't like, hor you know, it's just not a part of me. I'm not, a, it's not a part of me. Okay, now that's a silly example, but it's trying, I'm trying to illustrate the point that if you say you're something, then there should be some evidence, there should be some proof in your life that what you're saying is real. Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, neither of those count for anything, but only faith working through love. 
Paul was saying, listen, it's not an issue of, of, of re- it's not a religion, okay? It's not this, it's not about a ritual. It's about your, your faith working through love, okay? Again, not earning God's love, not, not trying to earn it, but uh, one commentary said, faith is no mere intellectual conviction, as if Christians can do as they wish as long as they believe the right doctrines. That's a horrible idea. To believe is to place one's personal confidence in Christ who loves us and gave himself for us. Therefore, Christians must, okay? Ch- Christians must respond in genuine and self-denying love for others. It's not just about what you say you believe, but it's about what you do because your faith is going to produce action. 1 Corinthians 15 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses because about, it talks about the transformation that came in Paul's life because of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. He says it was not without effect. It changed him. He worked hard, okay, not because he was trying to earn God's love, but because of God's love, he worked hard, and, and he, wanted, he wanted people to know about Jesus because of the grace of God, not in order to earn the grace of God. And if I was going to put this in, like, 2016 language, I'd say something like this. I would, if, if Paul was writing it now, it might, might be saying, you know, man, this thing has changed me, literally changed me. I'm working like crazy because I'm so blown away by the love that God has for me and where I was, okay, and now for where God has brought me today. You see, for Paul, works was just a natural response. It was just a natural response to his love for Jesus and the love that God had for him and showed for him. And imagine the ripple effect, okay? Imagine the the impact that we could have on this community if we went out of here living out our faith, living in the reality of the overwhelming truth of God's love in our lives. You see, the cross it, it, it kind of takes away all of our excuses and it makes them really, really small. What an impact and what a change we could make. First Baptist Church Allen, you and me, what a change we could make if we had a faith that led us to action. Second thing there, how can one church, how can our church change this community? Through a love that leads to compassion. A love that leads to compassion. Okay, and and the Greek word, therefore, it talks about there. You saw, remember before our God the Father, your work of faith and labor of love. That's in verse 3. Labor of love there. That carries the, the connotation of, of extraordinary effort expended. The commentary wrote, love as it is meant here does not stop with ordinary effort, but goes the second mile and even beyond for the sake of another. This requires a great, this type of love, this type of compassion that we're talking about, It requires a great spirit of self-sacrifice and self-denial. Now, I realize that I may have lost some of you already, especially when I said that church is not about you. Because I know some of you probably folded your arms or maybe you rolled your eyes. You, you, you you, you punched out of your Bible app and you opened up your Facebook or Instagram app and just started looking. Because I understand that this is not easy to hear, okay? I understand that it's not what you want to hear. Almost everywhere else in this world, things are catered to us. Okay? Right? Everywhere else in this world, most things are catered to us. Um, there, there's, we, we live in a world full of options. Okay? We, there's, there's like a million channels that you can watch, so you find something that you want to watch, and there's a million radio stations. You, 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 there's clothes. There's, commer- there's all kinds of things. There's menus. We live in a world full of options, full of menus, full of choices, and you, for the most part, you get to decide what you want, how you want it, and when you want it. But unfortunately, okay, unfortunately, some of us, we brought that same expectation into this place. And so we come in here and we say, you know what, I want it to be this way, and I want to make sure that you do it this way, you do it this way because that's the way that I want it. That's the way that I like it, okay? That's what I'm used to. That's what I want to do. And if you don't do it my way, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, send you an email or I'm going to write a note or I'm going to come complain because it's not the way that I want it. We say, well, I'll listen to that, and, and, well, and I like that. Oh, but well, wait a minute, I don't like that. Um, but I have to t- let me tell you something about that attitude. Being a Christ follower requires something of you. 
It requires a change. A change in how you live, how you view yourself, and how you view others. It requires a change in your priorities. It requires a change in attitude and your perspective. You see, Jesus didn't come to make you comfortable. He didn't come to make you comfortable. He didn't come to, so that you would, you would always be happy and that you would just be per, you know, just perfectly. You'd always feel good and, and everything would just be right for you. That's not why he came. And some of you, when, when, when that doesn't happen, you get angry and you get upset at God and you get upset at, at, at other people. But here's why Jesus came. He came to make you holy. He came to make you more like him. He came to radically change your life, and he's ready to empower you to live that new life. Self-sacrifice is a, is a quality that every believer should have. It's a daily battle. I get it. It's a daily battle to sacrifice self. Jesus knew that. Paul knew it as he was writing. He, in some, one of his other letters, he said, you know, there are things that I do that I know I shouldn't do. There's things that I should do that I, I know I don't do. It's, it's a daily struggle. It's a battle that we have to fight every day to be those living sacrifices for Jesus. But the love that God calls us to is different than anything else that you'll see in this world because God is unlike anything else that you'll ever encounter in this world. Matthew 9, 36. This is talking about Jesus and his compassion. He says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. In the Greek where that, that word for compassion, it carries with it this idea that there's not only, not only do you have this strong feeling, but with the strong feeling comes action. You do something about it. You see, Jesus never had just a feeling. It's like, oh, I feel so bad for them. And then he walked on. He never did that. Jesus felt compassion for the people and he did something. And, and that word, it, it's a word that's sometimes used for, for this idea of that, that it, it, it physically, it's like in your bowels, it physically hurts you. So like Jesus saw the people, and, and, and it made him sick. I mean, he just hated to see what he saw. Lost people, oppressed people, hurting people. How does that make you feel? Does it hurt inside? Do you feel it in your gut? Do you look upon your world with compassion to compassion that motivates you to action? I think if we're honest, a lot of us would, would probably have to say no. And why is that? Why is it that when we look in our community, why is it when we look um, at the people that we, we live, you know, live in our neighborhoods, or we look at the people where we work or do life with, why is it that we look at them and we don't have compassion, but instead we have apathy or we're numb to it? Or maybe we just assume, hey, some other Christian or church, or, or, or I don't want to offend them, I don't want to bug them. I ask this because, you know, sometimes that, that's, that's, a, that's me, and I think a big part of why we, why we do that or we don't do that is because we don't fully comprehend what the gospel is and, and its power. You know, you read John 3.16, and we can say it real quick, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I think that's lost its meaning. It's, it's just a, a neat little verse instead of seeing it as the transforming power of God and his mercy and grace that's extended to sinners, that was extended to, to me and 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 what he saved me from, and what he saved me to. You know, what else I think it is, is I think it's become a little bit too easy to be a Christian here in our community. I know it's getting difficult, okay? I, I know it's getting difficult, but, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't wake up this morning fearing uh, persecution. You know, I, I wasn't at all worried about if I came to this place today that I might be arrested I wasn't at all worried about that if I came up here today and I had my Bible and I opened my Bible and I read out loud from my Bible, I wasn't afraid that, that I might get killed for that or my family might be taken away from that or I might be in prison for that. I, I wasn't worried about that. I didn't, I don't, you may have been, but I, I'm not. I didn't fear that persecution. Why? Because it's, it's, we have freedoms and because, with freedoms, that, that's a blessing to thank God for. Don't, don't, don't hear me say that I'm, I'm angry because of that. I'm excited that we have that freedom, but sometimes with freedom comes this whole idea where we just, we just take it for granted. And, and I'm not trying to diminish the struggles that we face, but I think it's, it's, just, it's just easy. And one thing that I, I don't see here a lot, okay, is this whole thing of desperation. We're not desperate for God. I see it when I go on, on mission trips and I, and I go to other countries and, and, and I see people who are, who, are, who are desperate. 
And they know that if God doesn't take care of it, nothing is going to be, ever get done. And I think if, if we're not desperate for God, then why are we going to worry about other people who aren't desperate? You see, it hurt Jesus that people were being bullied and mistreated and oppressed. It hurt Jesus that people were serving other gods uh, and not serving the true God, his Father in heaven. It hurt Jesus that people were choosing to ignore him and his message of salvation, but instead choosing a religion over a relationship. And I've got to be honest here, it scares me sometimes to pray for that. It scares me to pray, God, help me to see people as Jesus saw them. God, help me to look over, look over my community and have compassion. You know why that scares me? Because I know if I see people the way that Jesus sees them, if I know if I pray that, then, then what that's going to do is that's going to cause me, I'm, I'm going to have to do something about it. Because if I pray, God, help me to see the people the way that Jesus saw them, then I can't make excuses anymore. Because I'll see it, and I'll have to do something about it. It'll make, it'll make me sick. I'll want to do something. It, it will hurt me that there are people in my neighborhood that don't know Jesus. It'll hurt me in, in, that it, where I work, there are people who don't love God. It'll hurt me that, that marriages all around me are crumbling, and so I've got to do something about it. And so that, that's a scary prayer. And, and for some of us, we, we, don't, we think, you know, I don't need anything else in my life right now to mess things up. I've got a good thing going. But I wonder what would happen in our city, okay? Remember, if our church, you and me, if we felt what Jesus felt, if we loved our community, and that love took us, made, caused compassion in us, a compassion that means that we would take action. John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment that you have, I'm sorry, that you love one another as I have loved you. 1 John 4.10 says, this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. There it is. There's the gospel again. Okay? Jesus showed us how to love. He told us how to love. Love like he did. He gave his life. He sacrificed his life. And I think if we could grasp a hold of that gospel, that reality and the depth of those verses, that it would, it would, it would change us. It would, it would rock. We'd be like Paul. This grace was not without effect. It changed how I fathered. It changed how I mothered. It changed how I, I worked. It changed how I grandparented. It changed how, what kind of coach I was. It changed what kind of worker I was. It changed what kind of kid I was. It changed everything about me, how I love my wife, how I love my husband. It changed it all because I understood what grace was. I understood the, the penalty that was paid for me. I understood what forgiveness was. I understood what God saved me from and what he's brought me to. It would change us and it would create such a huge love in us that it would just push us over the edge. And we couldn't help but have compassion for the people that God has placed in our lives. And then we do something about it. This city, I, I guarantee you, it would turn upside down if we truly lived in that reality. If we loved this city the way that Jesus loved this city. I know it's hard. I know what I'm talking about is hard because here's, here's the next one. How can one church, how can this church change a community? Through a hope that leads to endurance, through a hope that leads through, to endurance. There in, in First, Thessalon ah, First Thessalonians, Paul commends the Thessalonians for their steadfastness of hope in Jesus. You see, the, the believers, these men and women, they, they came under persecution. They came under ridicule. They faced hard times. And guess what? When you seek to live your life in accordance with God's leadership and His direction, it's going to look strange to a lot of people, and it's going to offend a lot of people. It just is. Because the gospel is so different. Jesus is so different than what the world is used to and, and what the world thinks it wants. But Jesus is what they need, but they don't recognize it. And so when we come in as, as, as Jesus ambassadors, it's going to look different. It's going to look offensive. It's easy to see in this world today, okay? It's, it would seem that if you hold a value or a belief that is anti to whatever the rest of the world is saying, then you're going to get labeled as maybe intolerant unacceptable, you're going to be labeled as a person of hate, maybe even as a person who's a bigot. The gospel of Jesus, it's just foreign to so many people. But in the face of adversity, unfortunately, in the face of adversity, many Christians are buckling under the pressure. You see, the world wants us to conform to them, but we're reminded that we're not to conform, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can know the will of God. 
Romans 5, 2 through 4 says, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. We can stand strong. Listen to this. We can stand strong in the face of opposition because our hope is not in being accepted by the world, but by but in Jesus Christ, okay? Because here's this, listen to this. You might want to write this down. Our hope is beyond this world. Did you catch that? Our hope is beyond this world. And so we can boldly go into our schools, into our places of work, into our neighborhoods, into our communities, and live a life that honors God because we know that our hope comes from the Lord and it's not dependent upon anything else. And imagine the power of a community of believers. Imagine the power that we would have if we went and we endured in the face, in the face of opposition. Of even though we know it might be an uncomfortable position, a uh, conversation, but we're going to do it anyway. Even though it, even though it might, it might cost me a little bit of my credibility because they, they they see me as this. But if I started living like this, then they may look at me differently. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter because we're not living for them. We're not living for their, for their acceptance. We're not living for, for their, you know, their support because our hope is in Jesus. And it's a bigger deal that they know about him and that we live for him than we try to fit in. Romans 8, 25 says, But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait patiently. Again, our hope is in Christ. And we wait for his return. We're, we're, we're ready for Jesus. You know, I, I look, sometimes you, you see it, you watch the news and you, you see what's going on in our world and we're saying, Jesus, come. Jesus, come. We're ready. We're ready for you, God, to, to, for, for it to be on earth as it is in heaven. We're ready for you to restore your new kingdom. We're ready for you to, to be Lord uh, uh, over, over it all. This world, this world is trying to, to do everything else and, and let everything else run the show, God, but we know that you are in control and we want, you want your power to be here. We want to experience that relationship with you. God, come. Reestablish your kingdom. But until then, we're called to love others. Until then, we're called to go. And as we wait, we're, we're being patient. We know he's coming. We know he's returning. But we're going to live our lives knowing that reality, that he's coming. So it's important that we tell everyone that we know. It's important that we live our lives in the reality so that people will know that who Jesus is and know about his love. We're called to love others. We're called to help others. We're called to encourage one another. We're called to be his hands and his feet. We're called to be his ambassadors. We go, not in our own strength, but in the strength that comes from God. And James 1, 2 through 3 says, My brothers and sisters, think of the various tests that you encounter as occasions for joy. After all, you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. I hate to be the, the bearer of bad news here, but one of the ways that we grow stronger is through trials. God uses them. There's purpose in the testing. The purpose is to make us more like him. The purpose is to make us rely more on him. And as we seek to be more like Christ, guess what? You're going to come under opposition. You're going to face some trials. You're going to face some tests. And as we face those, it's important to remember that as individuals and as a church, that we need to remain faithful to God's plan and purpose for our lives. You know what? Our city doesn't need another organization that just kind of keeps the status quo. Our community doesn't need another organization that does what everyone else does. Our city needs, it needs the church. It needs us, you and me, okay? It needs the church that's willing to follow the will of God no matter what it means, okay? Our, our city needs Jesus, Okay? I hope you agree with me on that. Our city needs Jesus. And the way that they're going to hear about Jesus and know about Jesus is through the church. Okay? In case you forgot, the church, that's you and that's me. That's how they're going to know about it. And it doesn't mean, let me, let me make sure we say, I, I say this. It doesn't mean that we're jerks. Okay? Because some of us, we can be real, come real strong with truth. And we can be jerks about it. And being a jerk is going to turn them off the other way. We're not going to do that. Jesus was never a jerk. Okay? But it does mean, it doesn't mean that we're not loving. But it does mean, and it doesn't mean that we, sorry, it doesn't mean that we soften our message so that it feels good to everyone. We're going to be people of truth, but we are also called to be people of love. And our city needs Jesus, and we've been called to be his representatives. Our hope is in Jesus, so we, we know that we can stand strong in the face of opposition. You know, I started with this question, 
And I'm going to end with this question. If our church went away today, would this community even notice? Would we be missed? And I think the way that we make a powerful impact, how we change this community, the way that we, we put God's fingerprints all over this place, the way that we reach people for Jesus is if we're willing to be people of action, to be people of compassion, and to be people of endurance. Action that overflows from our faith in Christ. Compassion that comes from this overwhelming sense of love for others and endurance that exists because of our hope in the future that God has for us with him in eternity. God has dropped us into this community and we should be making ripples that go far and wide. I love my church. And I pray that we shine a bright light on Jesus and that because of our presence, okay, people are drawn to him. Let's pray.